Okay, so it is August 15, 2014, Friday night. So let's pray. Our Heavenly Family, thank you for your blessings. Thank you for moving and for um, guiding us to accomplish the things that you have set before us. And I also just want to thank you for, thank you ahead of time for giving us the strength to do the things that are yet before us. And so help us all and bind all of us here that are all known together, um, bind us together in love and help us to understand the truth more and more. And Father and Mother, we're here still considering the third angel's message and continuing on seeking to understand the sanctuary. And this is a subject that we have such little understanding of, Heavenly Family, and we want to understand more. We know that it has such depth to it. So, Father, I know that you have orchestrated such wonderful plans. And, Mother, you have this incredible role in bringing salvation to us as well. And you brought forth children to be our saviors. So please, please guide us. Send wisdom to us to teach us the things of yourself. We're told that your way is in sanctity. And so, sister, please do that. Show us the truth. Help us to understand. Help us to have our minds enlightened and to put our minds um, to the investigation of the scriptures. Let not our understanding be dull and rid us all of every manner and every form of sluggishness and bring us to be active diggers in the mind of truth and uh, always finding gems each day. So, Heavenly Family, please guide us now. Help us to understand the truth better than we ever have before. Thank you so much. Be with us now. In the name of the branch, he and she. Amen. All right. So, last Friday night we talked a little bit about the sanctuary and Christ being the Son of God. And we looked a little bit at the first part of the epistle to the Hebrews. And um, during this past week, Teresa and I have been reading Hebrews a little bit, and then we never got to read through the whole thing together, but today I got the opportunity to finish off the rest of it. Um, And it is a book which can be highly recommended to everyone here. And I'm sure you have all read it before, but it's recommended to read it again. Um, It's one of the books which probably goes into this whole idea of the sanctuary, uh, the heavenly sanctuary in particular, more than any other book of the New Testament, which is interesting because it doesn't actually get into it a whole lot. And uh, and that's something even within the book that it tells us, how he doesn't get into a whole lot of detail. And so, well, I guess Hebrews and Revelation are the books that get into this the most. But it's something that we really need to seek to understand better. It seems as though 
the understanding that we've had from the third angel's message has come and it has grown over time, but there's still just so much that is not understood. So I think it's really important for us to uh, study this together and to see what we can learn concerning the sanctuary. don't know how many more studies we'll have in this series on the topic, but there's a lot of directions that we can go in. We can go and examine the different Bible passages that talk about book work in heaven, and we can also look at the different passages that are here in Hebrews, Christ's fresh atonement. You know, these are all different different aspects of the truth that relate to the sanctuary. And then there's, of course, the very broad and vast topic of the services of the sanctuary and their meaning, which includes the meaning of all of the feast days, all of the different appointed times, and all of the different rituals that took place upon uh, either one of the appointed times or special circumstances. So there's a whole lot there. <laughs> and, um, of course, not all of it has come through the light of the Third Angel's message so far. There's a lot more light to be revealed upon these topics. So we'll just start with some more of what we can find here in Hebrews. And then we will um, see where our Heavenly Family leads from there. So Hebrews chapter 1. Let's just do a, a real brief overview. Um, I'm just going to mention some things about each passage. Um, one thing I want to recommend, too, for everyone, is to read Hebrews in the NET the New English Translation. One of the things that's helpful is that all of the quotes from the Old Testament, it has them in bold, and it also, when the writer of Hebrews quotes a longer passage, it formats it in a way that makes it really easy to recognize as a quote. And this just helps to avoid confusion and I will just give an example uh, of the confusion that can be avoided by understanding which part is a quote and which part is not a quote. Um, but first, Leroy typed in that writing of O.R.L. Crozier is very interesting too. And yes, perhaps we'll take the time to actually go through that. That would be good and interesting. And, of course, we are recommended to read it uh, through the Spirit or by the Spirit through Ellen White. Um, now, the example that I'm going to give of something, certain uh, confusion that can be avoided by knowing what is a quote from the Old Testament and what isn't, that is, within the New Testament, <clears throat> it is, um, there's more than one place where this shows up. But, uh, I'll just mention it's in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22. And then there's also, um, let's see, Hebrews chapter, let's see where it says this most specifically. Okay, chapter uh, 2, verse 8. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8. Now, what it is, is it is a quote from Psalm chapter 8, verse 6, talking about the Son of Man and how God put all things under his feet or under his control. And the passage in Ephesians as well as the passage in Hebrews 2, is typically understood.
understood to mean that all things have been put under Christ's feet. In um, Ephesians 1, verse 22, it says, And have put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Now, when we read it in Hebrews 2, people think, okay, so Christ came, he became uh, incarnate into humanity, and then he rose from the dead, and all things were put under his feet by the cross. Now, the truth is, in 1 Corinthians 15, starting at verse 22, and in Daniel 7, it shows that Christ has not yet gained dominion over all things. And what we have to understand is that in these passages, it's quoting this verse from the Old Testament, not saying that it has already happened when these New Testament books were written. And this we actually see in the context in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8, it says, you put all things under his control. And that was quoting from the Old Testament. But that's the end of the quote. The quote starts in verse 6 and ends in verse 8. And then the writer of Hebrews says, for when he put all things under his control, he left nothing outside of his control. And he says right here, at present, we do not yet see all things under his control. So you see here he's saying, we do not yet see all things under his control. And the fact of the matter is that there are passages which deal with Christ gaining all dominion. And these are passages like Psalm 110, Psalm 2, Psalm 8, Daniel 7, 1 Corinthians 15. And it is something which is not yet fully accomplished. Now, on the cross, Christ did put to shame principalities and powers. And in that sense, gained dominion over them. But I'm just mentioning this as a side note to say, hey, when you read it in the NET, for example, it's really easy to distinguish what is a quote and what isn't a quote. And it clears up. Um, some of the common misunderstandings over passages like this. And in Ephesians, it is an important distinction to make because in Ephesians, when it talks about this passage in Psalm 8, it is using it to describe the finishing up of the mystery of God, which takes place in the last days, not something that took place 2,000 years ago. So anyway, so that's a recommendation. And what we see when we read the epistle to the Hebrews is that it is essentially a letter which is giving reasons from the Old Testament for the faith of the Nazarene in believing that Christ is the Son of God. And that the ceremonial system has transferred to the heavenly sanctuary. Those are some of the main points of Hebrews. And also in addition to that, Hebrews is constantly endeavoring to encourage people to be steadfast in the faith. Not to waver, not to return back into sin and so on. So Hebrews is a very important book. Now, the first chapter is primarily concerned with showing from the Old Testament that there is a Yahweh who is the Son of the Most High and that he is not just a mere human, and that he is not just a mere angel, a created being, but he is indeed God's son, and that 
God sent his son. And he quotes in a number of places here <clears throat> that that son, he re refers to Psalm 110, which is showing that that son would be made a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Now this, Psalm 110, is made use of all throughout Hebrews and all throughout the New Testament, but Hebrews really emphasizes it. And he draws on Solomon typology, showing this son is the antitypical Solomon. Uh, in That's in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, where he quotes 2 Samuel 7, verse 14, I will be his father and he will be my son. And he goes on and shows these things, so there's the son. And then in chapter 2, he talks, he starts getting into Psalm 8 and talks about how Christ, as the Son of God, actually was made and became lower than the angels and lower than the gods, the Elohim. And now he became brethren with us. And so he became of our very same flesh. So he's emphasizing all these things. And his purpose, the reason why he says that he became flesh of our flesh, blood of our blood, is so that he could be a merciful and faithful high priest. This is in uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 17. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every respect so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in things relating to God, to make atonement for the sins of the people, or to make a propitiation. It's how some uh, translations render it, which is basically an offering for sin. And then it says, For since he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. So it's saying that he became one of us in order that he can become a merciful and faithful high priest to make atonement for our sins. And how can he make atonement for our sins? Well, he can do that because he himself suffered when he was tempted and is able to help those who are tempted. So it's putting it in very practical, practical terms. There are very practical reasons as to why Christ had to become one with humanity, become human himself. And that is he had to enter into our very flesh, our very experience, and be tempted just like we are and have victory just depending upon the heavenly family in order to help us to do the same, to help us to have victory over temptation just as he had victory over temptation. And he does this by being our merciful and faithful high priest. Now, this is letting you know something right from the beginning. It's letting you know that Christ's high priesthood is intricately connected to his nature. Also, his high priesthood is for the purpose of victory over sins. It's to cleanse us from sin. and. That is also expanded upon by saying that he will help those who are tempted. So you see that here it's clearly talking about um, sin as being giving in to temptation. So we, he will help those who are tempted to not give in to temptation. So Christ's whole ministry is about having us not sin. Chapter 3 of Hebrews uh, goes into 
the whole idea of Moses and the house of God that was given in the time of Moses, and then Christ and the house that is given uh, under his stewardship or his leadership, and how he serves us as the son of the house, God's in God's house, and Moses served as a servant. And it goes through and makes the point that basically if those who heard the law which came by Moses, which was given to him by angels, if they received just penalties for breaking that law, how much more will we receive just penalties by turning from the law that is given through Christ himself? And it's using this to make certain points and it brings it back into focus later, talking about the covenants. Now, goes through this experience of the wilderness and calls people not to enter into rebellion like they did. Talks about the Sabbath rest in Hebrews chapter 4, which is clearly the rest which Christ gives. In the context of chapter 3, it makes it quite plain that the rest that is spoken of here is the rest from works that we can have by taking Christ's mind in exchange for our mind. Now, chapter 4, uh, or chapter 5 rather, continues on on this idea of priesthood. At the end of chapter 4, actually, it says, in verse 14, it says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high, pri a high priest incapable of sympathizing with our weakness, or weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us confidently approach the throne of grace to receive mercy and find grace whenever we need help. From this, it goes on to expound a little bit more on the idea of Christ's ministry for us as our great high priest. It talks about how all high priests are appointed to offer sacrifices. And it talks about how there would be a new high priest because, again, it says you are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And that was Psalm 110, which was clearly a prophecy of a Yahweh who was the begotten son of God who would enter into the Melchizedek priesthood. Now, he uses this whole thing of the Melchizedek priesthood to bring out lessons that relate specifically to our salvation and to everlasting life. So we want to talk about that a bit. But I want to mention how the whole thing of Melchizedek is not yet fully understood, but it's something that we should seek to understand. Because when the writer of Hebrews talked about this, he seemed to have a pretty definite idea in his mind as to what this whole thing of Melchizedek is all about. But anyways, in uh, Hebrews 5, the author gives um, certain information about Christ and how he can indeed be our high priest and how it's clear from the scriptures, and this is the point that the author of Hebrews is trying to make, that the scriptures tell us, hey, there's going to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And he's showing that there's something new uh, 
that was not previously understood that is in relation to those passages. Now, <clears throat> when he talks about this, coming to the end of chapter 5, he is saying that there's supposed to be this new priesthood. And then in chapter 5, verse 11, he says, On this topic, we have much to say, and it is difficult to explain since you have become sluggish in hearing. For though you should in fact be teachers by this time, you need someone to teach you the beginning elements of God's utterances. You have gone back to needing milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced in the message of righteousness, because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, whose perceptions are trained by practice to discern both good and evil. Now what he's saying here, he's just starting to get into this Melchizedek thing, and this whole thing of Christ's priesthood, and the heavenly sanctuary, although he hasn't gotten explicit on the idea of the heavenly sanctuary yet. But he's just starting to touch on this. And then he says, we have a lot to say on this topic. There's a lot here. And it's difficult to explain because you have become sluggish in hearing. Now, he goes on from this to say how you should already be teachers. You need to... But now you have become one who needs milk, not solid food. He's saying that you're inexperienced in the message of righteousness and that um, your perceptions are not trained by practice. That's the message that he's trying to convey to his readers. Now, the same thing applies to us today in how we have been in the hearing of all these messages. Now, the, the truths that we have been in hearing of are not precisely the exact same truths that Paul was teaching. Much of what Paul taught was lost throughout the Dark Ages, as well as Peter and James and the other apostles. But in this restoration, we have been coming to learn many things. All throughout the first angel's message, the second angel's message, the midnight cry, the third angel's message, the rod message, the branch message, all the way up till today, we've been learning these things. Are we teachers at this time? You know, we should be. We should be able to be teachers in these things which we have been learning. But we haven't been. We have been sluggish in hearing. And this is why we've had to go over the milk again. We've had to go over the things which we should be well acquainted with. Which, again, is one of the main reasons why we've been going over this whole series from the first angel's message. Because there's such a great need. And from the very beginning of going through this, the stated intent is that we come through this experience equipped to be teachers of the message of present truth and to teach all things First angel's message, second angel's message, midnight pile, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, you know, however you want to count those angels. It's all these points of truth. We need to learn these things as they are in truth and as they relate to justification by faith. So that's what we're going through now. So let us not be sluggish in our hearing in the very thing that we're going through both to um, make us able teachers and as a result of being sluggish of hearing. In other words, 
the reason why we're going through this is because we've been sluggish in hearing. And we need to be retaught the messages that we've been learning and hearing for years and years. And so how sad would it be that in this very time when we are going over the thing, the second time, relearning, retracing our steps, going back to the foundational elements, that even then we're sluggish of hearing. How sad would that be? Let us not do that. We should be taking notes in our studies. We should be um, not just coming and hearing because the hearers of the law will not be justified, but the doers of the law are the ones who are justified. So let us really, you know, when we study these things during the week, go and study it out. Study out what we talk about in these meetings, pray about it earnestly. And it says here, whose perceptions are trained by practice to discern both good and evil. You know, we need to become skilled in the message of righteousness and have your perceptions trained by practice. Practice in studying the scriptures and in studying the present truth. Practice in sharing it. And this isn't necessarily the same practice in the sense of um, ritualize it and rehearse it. No, this is the same practice it as in actually do it. <laughs> yeah, put it to use. Do it. And um, this is what we are called to do. This is the work of Isaiah 28 when it talks about those who would be having the the milk, line upon line, precept upon precept, so on and so forth. So this is what was going on back in the first century. Now, in Hebrews chapter 6, it says, Therefore, we must progress beyond the elementary instructions about Christ. So notice, we must progress beyond these elementary things and move on to maturity, not laying this foundation again. Repentance from dead works and faith in God, teaching about baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. Notice, those are the things that he's saying are the foundations that have already been laid that we must progress beyond. Now, notice something. We have become so far removed from the truth that these are all things that we have only been recently learning of. And there's still a lot here yet to learn. Notice, repentance from dead works and faith in God. That is one of the elementary principles which the people who were supposed to learn but the author of Hebrews was talking about, we're supposed to progress beyond that. Repentance from dead works and faith in God is the message of justification by faith. That's what Paul's first letter was on, Galatians. That's the gospel. You know, these are things that we should have had established long, long ago. But look, two years ago, none of us understood justification by faith. So our Heavenly Family has seen fit to guide us to understand it. And this is what they're doing. Teaching about baptisms. When I say that, or when we read that in Hebrews, teaching about baptisms, how many of us have a clear and concise understanding in our minds as to what exactly that is? What exactly that means? Teaching about baptisms. Hmm, it's not just baptism. It's baptisms. And hmm, what is baptism really all about? There's a lot that we have yet to learn on baptism. Laying on of hands. What is that all about? There's a lot that we have yet to learn concerning laying on of hands. 
resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. You know, these are all things that are part of the foundation. These are things that had already been taught to those believers in the first century. Now, for us, the things that we would have in our list would be slightly different. Since, again, these aren't the things that we've had thoroughly taught to us until some of them just recently. But the Advent message, we have the 2300 days, the investigative judgment for the dead, the fall of Babylon, the Sabbath, the sanctuary. You know, there's a number of different things. Everything that we've gone through in the past studies uh, during this whole series. And how much have we learned in this series that we didn't know before that perhaps we should have known before? So I just wanted to relate those things um, as a principle for us to understand and see to it that we earnestly endeavor to understand the truth. Now, just because we're, we are applying it in our day as well, as far as the principle, we're taking the principle of knowing what we should know and being ready to be teachers in that so that we can comprehend other things. Taking that principle and applying it. But that is not at all to detract from the immediate context of what the writer of Hebrews was trying to convey. In the immediate context, there were the believers in the first century. They were learning the truths of justification by faith, baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. These were foundational truths that they had laid. Now, the writer of Hebrews here is saying, we must progress beyond this. He just said, we have many things to say, but we can't explain them to you yet because you've become sluggish. And what did he have many things to say concerning? Well, the ministry of Christ being our high priest in the order of Melchizedek. These are the things that he's saying, we must progress beyond the elementary things and get to this other stuff because there's a lot here and it's important we need to become skilled in the message of righteousness so i'm going to read uh hebrews 6 starting at verse 1 again it says therefore we must progress beyond the elementary instructions about christ and move on to maturity not laying this foundation again repentance from dead works and faith in God, teaching about baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this is what we intend to do, if God permits. Notice he's saying here, we intend to do this, as in move beyond these elementary things, if God permits. Why is it that perhaps God may not permit? That's what's explained in verse 4. He says, For it is impossible in the case of those who have been once enlightened, tasting the heavenly gift, become partakers of the Holy Ghost, tasted the good word of God, and the miracles of the age to come, or the power of the age to come, and then have committed apostasy, to renew them again to repentance, since they are crucifying the Son of God for themselves all over again, and holding him up to contempt. So here he's saying, maybe God will not even permit us to move beyond these elementary things, because perhaps some have already apostatized from the truth and are beyond repentance. And there is, you know, the gospel will not do them any good because it will not be mixed with faith. Now, as we continue on in Hebrews, 
we see that he does get into some of these things that are progressing beyond these elementary instructions about Christ. But he doesn't get into the full detail that it seems he was wanting to. And this we learn in chapter 9, which let's just skip ahead to that a little bit right now. And then we'll go back. Hebrews 9, verse 1 says, Now the first covenant, in, in fact, had regulations for worship and its earthly sanctuary. For a tent was prepared, the outer one, which contained the lampstand, the table, and the presentation of the loaves. This is called the holy place. And after the second curtain, there was a tent called the Holy of Holies. It contained the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered entirely with gold. In this Ark were the golden uh, urn, yeah, were the golden urn containing the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the stone tablets of the covenant. And above the ark were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Now is not the time to speak of these things in detail. Now, what's happening here is that he just mentioned a whole bunch of things dealing with the sanctuary, both the holy place and the most holy place. And he said, now is not the time to speak of these things in detail. Now, earlier in the letter, he was hoping, saying, if God permits, we want to get into these things. But then later, he does get into it some more, but there's a whole bunch that he doesn't get into. And for that reason, it uh, is less explanatory than perhaps some of us would like because we would love it, wouldn't we, if in this letter he went and explained in detail what the lampstand is all about, what the candle or what the uh, table with the showbread is all about, what the golden altar of incense is all about, the Ark of the Covenant, and you know all these different things. We would like the details, um, but he doesn't give it here, and we need to seek to understand what all those things mean. But prior to this, and after this as well, he does go into some things. And we won't have time to read it all, but we want to at least kind of summarize some of the things that he was writing about here. To show the foundation for Christ's work in the sanctuary. And that's what the writer here is intending to do in Hebrews, to show this foundation. Now, as he continues on here, he goes back to Abraham and the promises to Abraham and the covenant to Abraham and how Abraham paid tithes to this figure, Melchizedek, and how, according to the prophecies, Christ would become our high priest after the order of Melchizedek, and the NET renders it in the order of Melchizedek. Now, in chapter 7, he gets into this more. <clears throat> and the things that he says about Melchizedek is that Melchizedek was basically greater than Abraham, is one thing. He says that Melchizedek means king of righteousness and king of peace. That Melchizedek is without father, without mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days nor end of life but is like the Son of God and remains a priest 
for all time. And he goes on and even says when he was writing that Melchizedek is still alive. And this, I'll just read this in uh, Hebrews 7. He says, Now this Melchizedek, starting at verse 1 of Hebrews 7, Now this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham as he was returning from defeating the kings and blessed him. To him also Abraham appropriated or apportioned a tithe of everything. His name first means king of righteousness, then king of Salem, that is, king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, he has neither beginning of days nor end of life, but is like the Son of God, and he remains a priest for all time. But see how great he must be if Abraham, the patriarch, gave him a tithe of his plunder. And those are the sons of Levi who received the priest, uh, the priesthood, is what I actually said in Greek, have authorization according to the law to collect a tithe from the people, that is, from their fellow countrymen, although they too are descendants of Abraham. But Melchizedek, who does not share their ancestry, collected a tithe from Abraham and blessed the one who possessed the promise. Now, without dispute, the inferior is blessed by the superior. So he's saying here, hey, Melchizedek blessed Abraham, and there's no disputing that the superior blesses the inferior. So Melchizedek is superior to Abraham. And in one case, tithes are received by mortal men, that is, the Levites, while in the other, by him who is affirmed to be alive. So you see here how the other case is tithes going to Melchizedek. So here he says that Melchizedek is affirmed to be alive. And it could be said that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid a tithe through Abraham, for he was still in his ancestor Abraham's loins when Melchizedek met him. Now, the writer here uses this to point out that in Psalm 110, it says to this begotten Yahweh, you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. So this one would become a priest with indestructible life. This is why Christ, after his resurrection, after gaining victory over death, never more to be brought under its power, became our priest in the order of Melchizedek. So what the writer of Hebrews is pointing out here is that the Melchizedek order is the order of everlasting life, the order of everlasting righteousness, the order of priesthood without end, and that in order for Christ to be part of that priesthood, he must have no end to his life. Now, this is used to show how that priesthood can minister everlasting life. That's what is used here. And it's so significant. This is what, once we get into chapter 8 and 9 and 10, that is what is being discussed, how the Levitical priesthood could not bring perfection, and that the Levitical order had to be abolished that the Melchizedek order might arise, and that the Old Covenant must be abolished in order that the New Covenant must live. It's quite a 
significant thing that is being spoken of in Hebrews. He's saying there was a covenant, and mind you, Hebrews is a further explanation of Galatians. I just want to point that out. Both Hebrews and Romans are further explanations of Galatians. Romans further explains the subject of justification by faith as it relates in particular to the moral aspects of the law of God, whereas Hebrews relates the subject of justification by faith uh, in connection with the ceremonial aspects of the law of God. And these are both included in Galatians, but it's later expanded upon in these separate books of Romans and Hebrews. Now, what is shown in in Hebrews is this system of salvation. It talks about how Moses at Mount Sinai was given the law and people were disobedient and there was a covenant made with them and how that covenant was inaugurated by blood and how that covenant had a priesthood and had a sanctuary, and had a high priest, and had sacrifices. And then it is argued in Hebrews that this new covenant must have a new priesthood, and a new sanctuary, and a new sacrifice, so on and so forth. Now, he makes this not as presenting a new doctrine just to be believed by the authority of this epistle in and of itself, but the arguments are drawn from the Old Testament, taking passages from Jeremiah which talk about a new covenant and saying, hey, look, this is how the Old Covenant was done. There was a sanctuary that was given them. There was a priesthood that was given them. All of this was part of that Old Covenant. So this new covenant must have a new priesthood. Well, is there anywhere in the Bible that tells us of a new priesthood? Well, yeah. Psalm 110 talks about this figure, Yahweh, the begotten Yahweh, becoming a priest that will abide forever in the order of Melchizedek. And then he goes on to talk about how this Melchizedek order is not of the lineage of Levi, but is of the power of indestructible life. And so Christ was raised to have indestructible life. So he became the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And he went into the heavenly sanctuary to become our great high priest. Now, Hebrews chapter 8 is where it gets more into the idea of the sanctuary. Hebrews 7 is about the priesthood. Hebrews 8 is getting into starting to touch on the sanctuary and touch, uh, talking about the covenant. Then Hebrews 9 gets more in detail into the sanctuary. Hebrews 8 says, at the beginning, Now, the main point of what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister in the sanctuary of the true tabernacle that the Lord, not man, set up. And he says, for every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So this one too had to have something to offer. Now if we, if he were on earth, he would not be a priest. Since they, there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. The place where they serve is a 
sketch and shadow of the heavenly sanctuary, just as Moses was warned by God as he was about to complete the tabernacle. For he says, See that you make everything according to the design shown to you on the mountain. But now Jesus has obtained a superior ministry, since the covenant that he mediates is also better and is enacted on better promises. And then he gets into how there is indeed an old covenant and there is indeed a new covenant. And it's really important that we obtain an intelligent understanding of this. But notice very clearly here, he is saying that there is a heavenly sanctuary and that that is the sanctuary of which Christ is high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now, it is interesting to note that when this understanding was given, this is what we see in Revelation. In Revelation, we see angels in the temple in heaven. Angels coming out of the temple, angels at the altar. There's the altar, there's the lampstand, there's all these different things in Revelation. And so if we want to understand more of the heavenly sanctuary, we ought to study Revelation, as well as Daniel, of course, since they go hand in hand. And also, we should see if there are any more inspired books that were written by the followers of Christ, which did not end up in our current New Testament. Because if there are that will very likely have more light for us concerning this transfer of the ceremonial system from the earthly system to the heavenly system, from the, Melch uh, from the Levitical order to the Melchizedek order. Now, something that we want to keep in mind, too, is that the Melchizedek order is something which preceded the Levitical order, because Melchizedek was there in Salem as the priest of the Most High God. The Most High is the Father. It's clear that the writer of Hebrews talks of Melchizedek as being a figure who is divine, who is still alive, the same Melchizedek to whom Abraham paid tithe is still alive according to Hebrews. And whatever it means to be without father, without mother, without genealogy, neither beginning of days nor end of life, whatever that all means, that is clearly applied to Melchizedek and the same Melchizedek that Abraham paid tithes to. So these are things to be investigated more thoroughly. I'll, I'll mention again, of course, some of the writings in the Old Testament pseudepigrapha may contain light for us on this. For instance, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, there is a scroll which is called 11Q13 or 11Q Melchizedek. And that scroll talks about Melchizedek um, and what Melchizedek will do in relation to the last days. And that Melchizedek is actually Elohim, is what it says in that scroll. Now, there's a study that we have where we read that scroll and we discuss it a little bit. Um, it's and all Teresa, with it. It's, uh, on YouTube, yeah. I'm sorry, yeah. It's on YouTube, and it's just under the audio only study, so there's no video to go with it. It's just a black screen with the words on that said, you know, meeting held on WebEx, such and such a date. Yeah, just go to WebEx 2013 playlist, 
and you'll be able to see it there. Yeah. And um, so we get into that a little bit. There's another school called the Testament of Amram, which is in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And there, Amram talks about how, and it's fragmentary, so there's not a, you know, we can't clearly read everything that it says because there's just parts of the document that were not preserved. But in there, he does talk about Melchizedek. And by the way, Melchizedek, we often say it like that. It's actually a Hebrew word that is built off of two Hebrew words. Melchi and Sedek. Melchi means king of or queen of, either one. And Sedek means righteousness. So there is Melchizedek, and in the um, this other scroll, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Testament of Amram, it talks about Melchi Resha, and Resha means wickedness. So Tzedek is righteousness, and Resha is wickedness. So Melchi Resha means king of or queen of wickedness. And Amram sees two watchers and they and he sees these two watchers in a vision and they are arguing about him or disputing about him in some way. And he sees them both and one they're both called watchers and one has three names and who is a wicked one, and who is called Belial, Prince of Darkness, and Melchi Resha. Now, this other one, the scroll, unfortunately, has enough damage to it, and it wasn't preserved, that it does not actually give the names of this other watcher. But it does say, that he is a holy priest to the Most High God. Now, priest to the Most High God is the same phrase that was used of Melchizedek. And there's other places in the scrolls that contrast Melchizedek with Melchizedek. But this other watcher we know is called priest of the Most High God, as well as it says uh, in the scroll here concerning someone connected to this Melchi Sedek that he will be chosen as a priest forever. Now that's the same language as Psalm 110, talking about the priest after the order of Melchizedek. So you see that there is. <clears throat> In this place, Melchizedek is clearly a divine being, as well as 11Q13, where he's clearly a divine being. And then there's another one called the Aramaic Apocalypse, which is 4Q246. And in that one, it also uses language which is very similar to Melchizedek and describes this person as being dissolved. So I'm mentioning some of these things for you guys to be able to look more into to understand what this whole Melchizedek means. And obviously the writer of Hebrews had to have gotten this from somewhere that Melchizedek is without father, without mother, without genealogy, without beginning of days, without end of life, and is still alive. You know, 
everything that the writer of Hebrews states was based off of things in the scriptures, showing, hey, there is a Yahweh who is the Son. The writer of Hebrews endeavored and succeeded to show that from the scriptures, and that that one would become a priest after the order of Melchizedek, and that that one would become one of us, would become brethren with us, would take on our very flesh. That is all stuff that the writer of Hebrews was endeavoring to show from the scriptures. And then this writer also based a lot of those things that he told about Christ on just statements concerning Melchizedek. Well, it would be strange for him to make these statements concerning Melchizedek with no foundation. If everything else that was said in Hebrews was said with a foundation to it. So, this is just another reason to investigate these things. The book of Enoch, by the way, also contains information about the heavenly sanctuary. So, we ought to understand that book and study it out. We ought to study Second Estrus, as it is called. You know, these are all things that we should study because the sanctuary is such a huge topic. But what we learn from Hebrews is that this new priesthood and this new covenant with this new tabernacle and this, you know, all these things is of the order of Melchizedek. And it has to do with this new covenant. And the emphasis that is made in contrasting the Old Covenant versus the New Covenant is that the Old Covenant could not purify from sin, but that the New Covenant can purify from sin. It talks about how Christ offered himself without spot to God through the eternal spirit or through the everlasting spirit. It's another way to translate that. And how the blood of Christ there can purge our conscience, conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So his whole emphasis is that he look. This ministry brings about in the people a new heart and a new mind that they no longer have to have conscience of sin. And so the thing is, there is a necessity for us to understand this. Remember how he says, or, you know, we're told that God sent his son into the world that he might save the world. And his name would be Yeshua that, because he would save his people from their sins. Now in Hebrews it said that he became one of us so that he might be our merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God. So here's the thing. His humanity, the reason why he became human was to be our high priest, showing that there is a definite reason why our high priest must be human. There is a definite reason. So this high priest had to be human, had to shed the blood of humanity, and had to offer it in the heavenly sanctuary through the eternal spirit. And we need to understand that better too, what it means for him to offer it through the spirit. Now, Christ presents before the throne of our heavenly family 
his own blood as he pleads on behalf of mankind. And there's a place here in Hebrews, it's uh, Hebrews 10, verse 18, he says, Now, where there is forgiveness of these, being sins and lawless deeds, there is no longer any offering for sin. So where there is forgiveness, there is no longer any offering. That shows us that when Christ forgives us of our sins, he no longer has to offer his blood for us. Christ does not have to bleed for us anymore once we have accepted that sacrifice. And that's why, of course, if someone is justified, they receive that gift and he stops interceding his blood on their behalf. Then, if they go back into sin, there is no more sacrifice for sins for them. Because they were in a place where there was forgiveness of sin. And then they turned back from it. But this is showing us an important thing here. How Christ bleeds for lost sinners. He intercedes on behalf of the world, and he ministers his own blood in the heavenly sanctuary. One main thing to, to draw from this is that there's a day when that ministerial work is to draw to a close. And the Day of Atonement, the time of cleansing the sanctuary, is the finale of the sanctuary work in terms of purifying from sin in the sacred year. It's the finale. It's the final atonement. And so with that, we need to understand, okay, we've already found out in our studies that Christ began the work of the Antitypical Day of Atonement in 1844. This is what's going on. It's coming to the point where he will stop bleeding on behalf of sinners. The sanctuary work is wrapping up. And we, at this time, have the opportunity of receiving forgiveness of sins so that he no longer has to offer his blood for our sins. And when we all do that, he won't have to offer his blood. He won't have to continue to cry out his blood. He will be able to cease and finally return to gather us unto himself and to bring us to the heavenly mansions for thousand years. And what a glorious day that will be. That is a day that is worth hastening. But in the meantime, we have this whole work of the sanctuary. In um first Clement it talks about this at least a bit more and discusses how we are part of that priesthood and how we also have sacrifices to offer. And this Lord's Supper Part 2 gets into this somewhat of how we are to observe the antithetical ceremonial law. But notice here that this is... Uh, Lord's Supper from the table to the altar back, part two. Okay. It's a bit more into this type and appetite of the ministry of Christ. It has to do with the daily. And of course, the prophecies in Daniel deal with this all the more. The daily being taken away and so on. And being restored. So there are, I mean, definitely are having all this and there's even more and more to us. And it's in these books. But there is yet so much more for us to learn. 
And it's important for us to learn because this whole system of the sanctuary is the system of salvation. So we should study it out. And I think tomorrow, as we continue on studying Genesis 6, whether we get into the book of Enoch tomorrow or not, I have no clue yet. But once that issue comes to an end, perhaps we can study more about what the book of Enoch has to say if we find out that it's a true book. Um, Because it has relevance to this heavenly sanctuary topic as well. Does anyone have any thoughts on anything so far? Actually, there's one last thing I wanted to mention in terms of this. The emphasis is how this new covenant relates to this sanctuary. That's something that we need to understand, how the idea of the new covenant is intimately connected with the heavenly sanctuary. And the whole service of the heavenly sanctuary is the service of this new covenant. And both were inaugurated by blood. One with the blood of animals, just as a symbol for that present time, and one with the blood of Christ himself. And all of these things in the heavenly sanctuary are about this new covenant, which the new covenant is a new mind and a new heart. That's what we ought to keep in mind. It is a new mind and it is a new heart. This was the message of the Netzarim, the message of the original followers of Christ. What set them apart was this Son of God become incarnate and his work in the antitypical ceremonial law. Now, this is the main truth. If you read what Victor Hoddeff says, uh, talking about the parable of the laborers, this is the main truth which was given at the third hour. This was the primary truth that the... um, apostles born. And this was the truth that was taken away during the Dark Ages and is now being restored in Adventism. Now notice something. Today, what are we talking about primarily in this message? Justification by faith. The new heart. The new mind. Right? This is being saved from sin. The new covenant was being made in the days of the apostles. Not as a re, uh, a fiction, but as a reality. It was beginning to be made because there was people like Paul who were actually receiving a new heart and a new mind. They were being justified by faith. And that was truly this new covenant being established. But the devil succeeded in shutting the road for a time, even 2,000 years, nearly by now. And so this is something which now, after all this time, this Netzarene movement is being restored. And it is being restored And the knowledge of these truths is also being restored. So the new heart and the new mind is being restored in God's people. And the knowledge of the truths that relate to this new heart and new mind are being restored as well. So I just wanted to mention that so we can keep the the context. I mentioned about our own history here in these latter days. And I mentioned about the history in the first century. And I just wanted to connect the two to show how connected they really are.
And I'll make another comment, and if anyone has something to say, feel free right after this to jump right in. I just wanted to mention how the writer of Hebrews was saying how, hey, we have so much to say to you on this. And then you read all the rest of it, and he never really got to explaining a whole lot. He explained some, but not a whole lot. And the reason given as to why he didn't explain more is because people had not learned what they needed to learn. They had not become teachers. They had become sluggish in their hearing, and they had become in need of milk, not skilled in the message of righteousness. So here's the thing. If we want to learn more about the sanctuary, if we want to learn those things that the writer of Hebrews wanted to write to these guys, we should seek to understand these things and move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ. So we need to have our foundation laid. We need to become skilled. We need to be teachers in these messages. The messages of the three sisters. You know, we need to know the Advent message, the beginning message, the advanced message, like the back of our hand, as they say. We need to know the message very, very well and be able to teach it. And when we do, then our Heavenly Family will be able to reveal to us a whole lot more concerning these things. I just want to notice the message that we have right now, and when I say this, what I mean is the the main thing that we are hearing, the message which is being conveyed to us in this specific meeting is the same message being conveyed in Hebrew where the writer of Hebrews was saying, we have a lot to say to you, but we can't get into it quite yet because there's a need for the foundation to be laid. You know, that's what we're being told right now. There's a lot that we need to know and a lot that we, uh, that our Heavenly Family has to tell us. But we have been so far behind and we have been unskillful in the message of righteousness. So let us be skillful in the message of righteousness. And let us enter into the promises of our Heavenly Family. And then they will show us these glorious truths of the sanctuary. And with those glorious truths, man, 2,000 years ago with the Nazarene movement, with its beginnings, in such a short period of time, it expanded and grew and many were saved from their sins. The same thing can happen today, and it will happen to an even greater degree. I just want to mention something real quick. I almost started laughing, giggling, whenever Trent said uh, that this letter to the Hebrews, whoever wrote it said, Man, I've got all kinds of things to tell you. But then, at the very end of the book, he says, For in fact, I have written to you briefly. <laughs> in other words, it was a short letter. Oh, yeah. But he had a lot that needed to be said. And he, at the beginning, like Trent read, it said, you know, maybe God will allow it, but it wasn't allowed to all be stated. Very little was stated. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that were stated were left without much explanation, like the stuff about Melchizedek. But that's not to say that these things are incomprehensible mystery, or that we ought not to understand it. In fact, it's indicating to us that we should understand it because the whole point of letter was to say there's a bunch of stuff here that you need to understand, but you can't yet because you've become sluggish. So, any other thoughts on that? It encourages me that perhaps next week 
we will continue on with some of the foundation truths that we've received, um, move beyond the subject of the sanctuary itself, um, and perhaps we should go and lay the foundation of things that have already been clearly revealed, and let us, let's just keep this in mind as we go through, keep this study in mind as we go through the rest of the series on these messages. If we go through and we are slow of hearing and sluggish and we do not study to show ourselves approved, and I'm saying this like all of you here, I want to I want to emphasize the individual responsibility that you have to yourself and to the group for every one of you. If you choose to allow the distractions of this life to get in your way and you do not make a thorough study of the scriptures daily and you do not study to learn these truths in such a way that you can share it with others. You will, if you are not progressing in that regard, you will be retrograde. And you will become more and more sluggish in hearing the truth. And our Heavenly Family will not be able to reveal the glorious truths of the sanctuary that they want to reveal to you. They won't be able to. So if we, as we go on through this series of studies, I urge you, Take it upon yourselves to study earnestly. Every study, make it a point to say, okay, the truths which I just heard, I need to, like, let's just take an example. Let's say one of the studies that we had on the 2200 days. Each of you, after that study, should have taken that week and study that topic out so that by the end of the week, you could present the same truth that we discussed the week on prior to anyone who had a question about it. And perhaps even an expanded version of that. Because as we study, we'll, we will all see things that someone else perhaps did not see. We'll see gems of truth. So this is what we ought, we ought to do for all these different studies. Let's say we study on what the Bible has to say about the materiality of angels, for instance. Well, by the next week, everyone here should be equipped because of the hearing that they had in the initial study and because of the personal study that they had throughout the week, one week later after giving the initial study, everyone here should be equipped to show someone from the scriptures the truth of the materiality of the angels. Just as an example, we should do that all the way through. We should become thoroughly grounded. And here's the other week. If you do not take the time and through practice, have your perception strengthened to see good and evil and to see truth and error. If you do not do that, you won't really know the truth for yourself. If, if a crisis comes and your faith is not founded upon the Word of God, if you can't say, yes, I know that the Scriptures teach such and such, I've read it myself. I thoroughly investigated it myself. If you cannot answer with an it is written like Christ himself did, when crisis comes, you will sit there and wonder, oh, was Trent right? Or, man, I sure hope Trent was right. Or, man, I sure hope someone else was right. Or whatever the case may be. You know, you won't have the surety and the certainty that you absolutely must have. 
only those who are thoroughly acquainted will survive in these last days. And that's being thoroughly acquainted with the scriptures. If you are not thoroughly acquainted with the scriptures right now, then you need to be. And need is something that I'm saying not in the sense of a figure of speech, but it is an absolute necessity. It is vitally important for all of us. So let's study the truth. Let us seek to be in a position where our Heavenly Family can and will reveal amazing truth to us. And some of these truths, of course, are the truths of the sanctuary. So again, how things go is dependent upon us. If, if you decide that you will take up the study of the scriptures and that you will become proficient in running to and fro in the world. And by the end of this, when we go through all these messages up to the present, we can be assured that our Heavenly Father will reveal much, much more to us. If you do not, and when I say you, I want each of you to take it personally. If you do not, we may very well get to the end of this. And our Heavenly Father will say, okay, now you need to go over it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah? But we don't have time to go over this again and again and again and again. We should all together here once go through it once together. And then at the end, each of us should be able to take someone else and really come to the faith through all of this individually in perhaps even more detail than we're going through it now. You know, so just like it says at the beginning of Hebrews 6, therefore we must progress beyond the elementary instructions about Christ. We must and move on to maturity. You know, we absolutely must. So let us do that. And we can be sure that I haven't come to this so long. All right. Well, I'm not seeing many uh, comments or thoughts that uh, anyone has in particular. So unless anyone wants to uh, just jump in right now, we should close with prayer. All right, let's do that. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Family, thank you for your love. Thank you for your life. Brother, thank you for taking on our very nature, for becoming one of us, and for doing so in order that you might be a merciful and faithful high priest. We really do want to understand more of your priesthood. We want to know what you've been doing from day to day for the past 2,000 years. And uh, on special occasions during that time as well. We want to understand these things clearly and thoroughly. But we know that in order for that to take place, we must be thoroughly grounded and rooted in the things that you've already shown us. And it just makes sense because, you know, you're giving us talents. And if we just bury it or hide it in an app, how can you entrust us with more talents? And so we've seen that you're giving us many, many talents here. And uh, so I want to ask that you impress it upon us here to put those talents to good use and to multiply them so that you can give us even more. 
Know that with that, we can do your works in this world. Heavenly Family, we want the dominion of the work of God, and we want to see all things put under your feet, our dear brother. Sister, we want to see you exalted, and we want to shout out grace, grace unto her, to all those looking on. So may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And may we do the works of this antitypical ceremony law in the order of Melchizedek here upon this earth as well. And if we must do these things, we must understand it. So please bring us to a place where we are able to hear, refine our ears, rouse all of us here from all sluggishness. We need your life. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Be with all the branches that aren't able to be here as well and um, impress the truth upon them that we've been looking at this evening. Thank mm-hmm. you so much. Thank you, Father and Mother, in the name of your Son and God, the branch. Amen.